This is IB Physics SL. I am Mr. King. Topic 2 Mechanics. Section 2.3 Work, Energy, and Power. There are many types of energy that we will learn about in physics. For this unit, we will focus on just three. The first is kinetic energy, which is the energy possessed by an object due to its motion. The equation for kinetic energy is one half times the mass of the object times its velocity squared. The next type of energy in this unit is gravitational potential energy. This is the energy possessed by an object due to its position in a gravitational field. The equation for gravitational potential energy is mass times gravitational field strength times height, or weight times height. Rather than change in height, Delta H represents the height of the object relative to some position that we have defined as the zero point. This might be the ground, the floor, a tabletop, or some other position that is probably the lowest the object could reasonably go. The last type of energy for this unit is elastic or spring potential energy. This is the energy stored as the result of the deformation of an elastic object, like a spring or a rubber band or something that behaves in a similar way. The equation for elastic or spring potential energy is one half times the spring constant times the change in length squared. Before we look at some examples, let's talk about the units of energy. For the kinetic energy equation, we would plug in kilograms and meters per second, which get squared, and we would end up with kilogram meter squared per second squared. For gravitational potential energy, we would have kilograms times newtons per kilogram times meters, or kilograms times meters per second squared times meters, and we would also end up with kilogram meters squared per second squared. For the spring potential energy, we would get newtons per meter times meters squared. A newton is a kilogram meter per second squared, which would then be divided by a meter, but then multiplied by a meter squared, and we would end up with kilogram meter squared per second squared. Since kilogram meter squared per second squared is quite a lot to say and to write, this combination of units has been defined as the joule, which is named for the 19th century English physicist James Prescott Joule, who studied the nature of heat, among other things. Energy is a scalar quantity. Let's take a look at some examples. First, a kinetic energy example. A garbage truck has a mass of 1.5 times 10 to the 4 kilograms and drives down the street with a speed of 13 meters per second. How much kinetic energy does the garbage truck have? The kinetic energy equation is 1 half mv squared. We can substitute in our given values and find that the kinetic energy of the garbage truck is 1.27 times 10 to the 6 joules. Now for a gravitational potential energy example. A helicopter with a mass of 1,350 kilograms hovers 300 meters above the ground. Relative to the ground, how much gravitational potential energy does the helicopter possess? The equation for gravitational potential energy is mg delta h. We can plug in our known values and find that the gravitational potential energy of the helicopter is 3.97 times 10 to the 7 joules. And finally, an elastic potential energy example. The spring in the suspension system of a car has a spring constant of 98 kilonewtons per meter. How much elastic potential energy is stored in the spring when it is compressed 5 centimeters? The equation is 1 half kx squared. We can plug in our given values, making sure to express this in units of newtons per meter and meters and find that the potential energy stored in this spring is 123 joules. Let's talk about energy and work. Energy is often described as the ability to do work. Work is defined as the energy transferred to or from an object via the application of force along a displacement. It kind of seems like these definitions are circular, Energy is the ability to do work, and work is the transfer of energy. This really just means that energy and work are basically the same thing. 
Here we have a soccer player swinging their leg toward a ball, and their leg and their foot has lots of kinetic energy. When the player's foot and the ball come in contact, the foot exerts a force on the ball, and while they are in contact, the foot and ball together have some displacement. During this time, work is being done on the ball by the foot. As a result of this work, the ball ends up with kinetic and gravitational potential energy. Work can be calculated as the dot product or the scalar product of the force applied to an object and the displacement of the object while that force is being applied. Here's a woman pulling some rolling luggage. She exerts a force in the direction of her arm. And while she exerts that force, she and the luggage end up with some displacement. In this case, the woman's force and the displacement of the luggage are not in the same direction. Instead, there is some angle theta between them. The equation for work, therefore, is force times displacement times the cosine of theta. Having the cosine theta in the equation is basically building in the calculation of the horizontal component of the force. If the force, or its component in this case, is in the direction of the displacement, the work done is considered positive. If the force is opposite the direction of the displacement, the work done is considered negative. Let's take a look at the units of work. Since work is force times displacement, we would substitute newtons times meters, which is kilogram meters per second squared times meters, which gives us kilogram meters squared per second squared. That's a joule. If work and energy are the same thing, they better have the same units. Let's take a look at a work example. A kid mowing the lawn pushes the lawnmower with a force of 200 newtons at an angle 35 degrees above the horizontal. When he has pushed the lawnmower 20 meters across the yard, how much work has he done? Well, the equation is force times displacement times cosine theta. We can plug in our known values and find out that he did 3,277 joules of work. Before moving on, we should address the work energy theorem. This states that the net work done on an object is equal to the change in the kinetic energy of the object. See if you can follow this brief derivation. We'll start with one of our UAM equations and rearrange it a little bit. If we multiply both sides by m, on the left we'll have ma, which is force, and on the right we'll have 1 half m times v squared minus u squared. This is essentially fs on the left and 1 half m v squared minus 1 half m u squared on the right, which is work equals change in kinetic energy. Let's take a look at an example. How much work is required to accelerate a 1,000 kilogram car from 10 meters per second to 20 meters per second? Well, the work done is going to equal the change in the kinetic energy of the car, which is 1 half m times v squared minus u squared. If we plug in the mass and final and initial speeds of the car, we find that the work done has to be 1.5 times 10 to the 5 joules. As usual, we must also be able to interpret graphs related to work and energy. In this case, we'll be looking at graphs of force versus displacement. This graph shows a constant force of 14 newtons, causing an object to eventually have a displacement of 12 meters. Well, the work done would be force times displacement, which gives us 168 joules. This is also the area under the graph. That rectangle has a base of 12 meters and a height of 14 newtons with an area of 168 joules. This fact is especially useful if we're dealing with a force that is not constant. The area under the graph is still equal to the work done. In this case, the area under the graph is represented by a triangle with an area one-half base times height. 
If the force steadily increases from zero newtons to 20 newtons, all while the object has a displacement of 12 meters, the work done is one half times the base of 12 meters times the height of 20 newtons, giving us 120 joules of work done. This graph might look familiar because it's basically the graph of the force on a spring. As a spring is stretched or compressed, the amount of force applied to the spring increases. For a simple spring that obeys Hooke's law, we find that the area under the graph is one half times the force applied to the spring times the change in the spring length. We know that the force applied to the spring is kx, which gives us one half kx squared for the area. The work done on a spring equals the spring potential energy. Finally, let's take a look at power. Power is defined as the rate at which work is done, or the work done per unit time. In equation form, we can write power equals work divided by time. Since work is force times displacement, we can rewrite this as power equals force times displacement over time. Displacement over time is average velocity, so we can also rewrite this as power equals force times average velocity. The units for power would be joules per second, which honestly seems like a perfectly reasonable unit to write and say. However, we have defined a joule per second as a watt, named for the 18th century Scottish inventor James Watt, who contributed to the development of the steam engine. Let's take a look at a power example. The kid that was mowing the lawn did 3,277 joules of work pushing the lawn mower across the yard. If that took him 30 seconds, what was his power? Well, power is work over time. He did 3,277 joules of work in 30 seconds, which means that his power was 109 joules per second, or 109 watts.